Good morning, everyone. It's time for worship. It is Sunday, November the 1st, and we're here in the sanctuary at Ansley United Church in Markdale, Ontario. So happy to have you joining us today. And uh, today we have a special treat for you. We have uh, uh, Henry Reinders here from the Canadian Food Grains Bank. We're looking forward to hearing from him uh, with his message in uh, just a few moments. So um, present with uh, me today is our organist, David Fries, our crew, uh, David and Carol and Tim. And we have uh, Connie and Leora here to sing for us today. So uh, a fun time will be had by all. Just one little announcement. Uh, next week is our Remembrance Day service, and uh, we're hoping that, of course, you'll be at home, uh, but you'll tune in on November the 8th to see our Remembrance Day service in conjunction with uh, the Anglican Church here in town. So without further ado, we'll have our prelude with David Fries. The presence of this light reminds us of the presence of Christ in our hearts, in our minds, and in our bodies. Let this light be courage. Let this light be hope. Let this light be strength for all that comes our way in worship and in our daily lives. We'll begin with our hymn, our first hymn, which is number 595 in Voices United, 595, and it is We Are Pilgrims on a Journey.
in the darkest valley or gathered at the table of joy, in the hard work life brings us or in the moments of ease we may find, in our day-to-day -day reality, joy and sorrow mixed together, may there be times set aside like this now for worship, for listening to the spirit, for paying attention to our call to love and serve others. And with every step we take, may goodness and mercy follow us and be the gifts we leave behind. I invite you to join with me in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, in love, you have opened the doors to our hearts and minds and spirits. You have welcomed us all into the inner chamber of your love for us and for all of creation. You brought us to the banqueting table, saints and sinners alike. You spread a feast before us, filled with the richest fare, a feast of compassion, a feast of joy, a feast of love for the body and soul. We come with joy to meet you here. We come to be nurtured and fed by the breadth of your divine love. We come to be inspired to take that love you give us and to transform it into acts of hope, acts of kindness, acts of generosity. May your spirit inspire us lead us and guide us as we come together in this moment of love and blessing. We pray in Christ's name, amen. We're going to sing another hymn, and this one is Draw the Circle Wide. It is from More Voices, number 145, Draw the Circle Wide.
I really love that hymn, and uh, when we're able to be back together in, uh, in the sanctuary together, we're going to sing that hymn, and we're going to go crazy. Well, let's take a moment for prayer, our prayers of the people. Let us pray. Gracious God, beloved one, feast giver, we find ourselves awed by the gifts of your grace, even in this time of COVID. We find ourselves blessed in so many ways. Even as we listen to this service, we have food, we have coffee, we have warm houses, we have friends to share it with. There's so much abundance, even in this most difficult time. Your love surrounds us and never fails us. And even as you hold the world in the palm of your hand, you call us to hold the Christ light for those in need. Our building may be closed, but our ministry carries on. You call us to care for the hungry, to offer our gifts for those with less, to take care of those who live with food insecurity, both here in our very rich country and those in other lands. Your love holds us and completes us. Yet even as we take your love for granted, Help us to love the stranger. Help us to reach out to the lonely and the fearful. Help us to hold in our hearts those who are grieving, those who are struggling. Help us to open our circle wide, to become more inclusive with each step, to be stretched to love beyond our normal thresholds. And today, as we think of the Food Grains Bank and the work it does on our behalf, help us remember we have so much to share. That when we are generous with our hearts and our spirits and our giving, it blesses us. Help us to find that even as we seek to love the world as much as you love it, O oh God, we may also find our hearts drawn wider still. God of love, hear us now as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, our scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, and these are verses 13 to 21, the feeding of 5,000. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately in, to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. But as evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. 
Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Now the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides the women and children. So here ends our reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Thanks be to God. Well, now uh, it's time for us to have our guest speaker, who is Henry Reinders from the Canadian Food Grains Bank. He is the Ontario Quebec Regional Representative for the Food Grains Bank and has gracious, graciously offered to speak to us about the work of the bank and how our donations from Ansley have an impact on places around the world. So welcome, Henry. We're looking forward to having you. Thank you, John. Thank you for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here with you folks this morning at Ansley United. I actually don't live too far away from here. My farm is about 20 minutes away, and I was a dairy farmer for many years, retired from that a few years ago, and have uh, always been involved with the Food Greens Bank forever, it seems. I've been involved with our Food Greens project in Meaford since 1997. And just this past year, after having a couple of learning tours to both Malawi and India, I took on the job of the Ontario Regional Representative full-time with the Canadian Food Grains Bank, and I'm delighted to be here with you this morning talking about the work of the Canadian Food Grains Bank. For those of you not familiar with the Canadian Food Grains Bank, it is a Canadian Christian organization that works to alleviate global hunger. We are made up of 15 churches and church-based agencies, all working together on this one aspect of trying to eliminate global hunger. Last year, we provided $42 million of assistance for 866,000 people in 34 countries around the world. And it is by working together with these 15 churches that we are able to accomplish so much. Working together as a group with God's grace and God's assistance that we can work on this issue of global hunger. The Canadian Food Grains Bank programming is in three areas. Food assistance programs, which is the first area, is our programs that are designed to feed people who, who, through no fault of their own, have no source of food. Second area is agriculture and livelihoods programs, which provide training to give farmers the tools and knowledge to increase their food production capabilities. And the third area of emphasis, and a smaller area, is the nutrition programs for nursing mothers and young children. The Canadian Food Grains Bank is one of two organizations the Canadian government turns to for help and advice on world hunger issues, and we have been the beneficiary of a grant that will match donations up to four to one to a maximum of $25 million a year. So if you think about that, a $20 donation, in fact, becomes $100. This year, the COVID pandemic has created economic disruptions and job losses across the world. Many humanitarian organizations are now warning that COVID-19 is leading to a hunger pandemic. The World Food Program says we may see the worst humanitarian food crisis since World War II. That's the worst crisis in 75 years. A recent United Nations news report stated that the number of malnourished people has been steadily climbing in step with the global population for the last five years. In light of this, the Canadian government has given an extra $2.3 million to use for protecting and strengthening small-scale farming livelihoods affected by COVID-19 in Africa. Donations to this program are being matched on a three-to-one basis so that over $3 million will go toward these efforts. I want to switch gears now and talk a little bit to you today about my Canadian Food Grains Bank learning tour to Malawi. Let me start by saying that I am a farmer, and for 28 years I milked cows every morning and every night, seven days a week, 365 days a year. On top of that, I grew the crops to keep them fed, nursed them back to health, and when they were sick, and maintained the equipment to keep them milked. In 2017, I retired from the dairy business, but I kept about 300 acres of land to continue as a crop farmer. My time became way more flexible, and I don't have to wake up at 4 o'clock every morning, but I still do. 
And I know a thing or two about dealing with the frustrations of changing weather, crop pests, equipment breakdowns, fickle markets, etc., etc. The flexibility of not having to look after livestock day in and day out finally gave me an opportunity to travel to Malawi in February of 2018. Malawi, located in the southern and eastern portion of Africa, is home to 19 million people in an area that is roughly equal to the size of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick combined. Half of the population of Malawi live below the national poverty line of $1.90 US per day, less than $700 a year. Malawi is one of the poorest countries in the world, and 80% of their population are farmers who have an average land holding of just two acres. Corn is the crop of survival in Malawi. Wherever you go, you will see corn, as you see in this picture here. It is growing in the fields, in the ditches, on front lawns and back lawns. It is everywhere. We were told that if a day passes where a person has not had a meal with corn, that person will feel as though they have not eaten properly for that day. Malawian farmers also know a thing or two about the frustrations of dealing with changing weather, crop pests, poor markets, etc. But unlike me, they also know the pain of failing crops, food shortages, hunger, malnutrition. You see, most of Malawi's population rely on that two acres of land to feed a family of six, seven, eight, or even more people for an entire year. The summer of 2018 was the driest I can ever remember in my many years of farming. We planted our crops, full of hope as we are every spring, and then we waited. The crops began to grow, luscious, healthy, green, and as May turned into June, the soils became drier and drier, and the growth slowed. We listened to the forecasts. We watched the skies. We looked at the radar on days when rain was pre predicted, only to see time and time again the green areas of rain wither to nothing as they crossed Lake Huron. And if they did make it across the lake, it was like there was a wedge above our area that drove the rain to the north or to the south. Through June and then July, it stayed dry and got hotter. Oh yeah, we got the odd shower, just enough to get us really excited, but after 10 minutes, maybe 20 if we were lucky, it would stop. Another millimeter of rain, barely enough to keep the dust down. The hay crop stopped growing, the grain crops were stunted, corn plants twisted and spiked in a classic response to drought. Soybeans remained short, everything was suffering. We harvested a hay crop that year that was two-thirds of a normal crop. The second cut was only 25% of what it should have been. Spring wheat yielded less than half of what we would normally expect. Corn yields were down. The only bright spot was soybeans, which did surprisingly well that year. And despite disappointments like these, we carry on. It may have been a difficult year, but it was not the end of the world. We still had food on the table and resources to pull us through. And that is the biggest difference between us and our fellow farmers in Malawi. If we have a crop failure, we can carry on. If they have a crop failure, they are in a very desperate situation. They have no food. They have nothing to eat and they have no insurance, no family, no safety nets to fall back on. They go hungry. The first project visit our tour group made was near the capital city of Lilongwe in the Kutsuwe district. This was a Nazarene Compassionate Ministries food assistance program where emergency food aid was provided to 2,000 vulnerable families for four months in 2017. We met several people, including Kalinda David, who you see here in this picture, standing in her field of corn. One of the reasons people are experiencing crop failures in Malawi is climate change. Time and time again, we were told that the weather is different now than what it used to be. The rains come later in the year and earlier than normal. Rainfall is more sporadic and sometimes very heavy, leading to flooding. Temperatures are more variable. It has created an environment to which they have difficulty adapting. Because of their total reliance on corn, there are other reasons for meager crops, which include poor soil fertility, 
improper planting techniques, and insect pressures. When we visited with Kalinda, we went to see her two-acre field of corn, which she relies on to feed her family of seven grandchildren and a paralyzed brother. It was weak, sparse, and very spindly, again, as you can see from this picture. This would obviously not provide enough food for their family in the coming year. So I asked Kalinda, I said, if your corn crop fails again, would you try something different next year? And her answer surprised me. She said, no, because we need corn. It is all that we know. And that's when it hit me in a rather emotional way. While weather, soil fertility, and planting techniques all play a part in their lack of food, the single most important thing the most important obstacle of them becoming self-sufficient in their food requirements is knowledge. Corn has been their mainstay all their life. They know nothing else, and without it, they are in dire straits. Now, let me take you five hours north to Ekwendeni near Mizuzu. Between a late departure and a host of bus problems, this was actually a nine-hour trip, but that's a whole other story. The Equindeni region was where we were split up to stay for three nights and four days with local host families. While most of us had some concerns about this part of our trip, it turned out to be the most wonderful and rewarding experience we ever could have imagined. These homestay visits really allowed us to get to know our host families on a very personal basis and taught us a lot about life in Malawi. It really was an unforgettable experience. My host was Pressings Moyo, a community leader within his area. He is married with seven children, three of whom are still at home. And Pressings is quite fluent in English and was easy to converse with. And this is his story. Pressings is part of the MAFA, which is the Malawi Farmer to Farmer Agroecology Project, a joint five-year program sponsored by Global Affairs Canada and Presbyterian World Service and Development. This is an agriculture and livelihoods program of the Canadian Food Grains Bank, which, unlike the food assistance programs that focus on emergency food aid, these programs direct their efforts toward teaching farmers how to improve their food security, their nutrition, and soil health. Pressings has 10 acres. By Malawian standards, he is a large farmer. And prior to 2010, he could not grow enough food to feed his family from these 10 acres. He struggled with poor crops and said at one point they were so weak from their constant diet of leaves from cabbage-like plants that they couldn't even go out to the field to work. Their problems were many, poor soil, drought, too much rain, and pests, just to mention a few. In 2010, he joined the precursor to the MAFA project where he began to learn about new agricultural techniques. The first thing he did was to take one acre of land and instead of planting the traditional corn crop, he planted ground nuts, which are peanuts, and pigeon peas. As you likely know, corn is very demanding of soil fertility and is a heavy user of nitrogen in the soil. And after several years of corn, the soil will be depleted of its nitrogen reserves and corn will not do well. Ground nuts and pigeon peas are legumes which have the unique ability to fix nitrogen from the air into the soil. So I think you can see where we're going with this. After two years of growing ground nuts and pigeon peas, which by the way were also a new source of food for the family, Pressings returned to planting corn with the newly learned technique of planting one seed per hole in holes that were six inches apart and in rows that were spaced by 15 inches. He was utterly amazed and how it flourished because it now had adequate reserves of nitrogen to draw from. So in three years, he learned about crop rotation, improving soil fertility using nitrogen-fixing crops, and alternate sources of foods, and proper planting techniques. He has since gone on to add chili peppers, sorghum, cassava, soybeans, millet, and bamboa nuts to the list of crops he grows. A new agricultural research center being built in the region will continue to help inform pressings on how to improve existing crops and to add new crops to his mix. In seven short years, pressings went from not having enough food to feed his family to having an excess that he could sell. 
He has been able to improve his standard of living as witnessed by the new house he built in 2014, and he has been able to send children for further education beyond grade eight. And it doesn't stop there. As a community leader, Pressings is now hosting meetings and training sessions, and others are learning from him. His success speaks volumes to others, and more and more people are eager to learn how he and others have been so successful. And to sum it up, I love this quote from Jane Saranda, a fellow MAFA participant since 2010. She says, using these new farming techniques means no more piecework, no more hospital for sick children, and no more worries. She no longer has to go out and work for other farmers to make ends meet for herself. Her children are healthy, and it has reduced the stresses so many times in her life. There is a beautiful story that goes along with this that I love to tell. In 2000, a Canadian university student by the name of Rachel Besner Kerr came to the Equindeni region of Malawi looking for 10 mothers facing hardship with hunger to work with her on her master's project. She started a program to teach cooking skills using different vegetables to improve health and nutrition. The program ran for one year and was remarkably successful. The following year, more women came forward asking to be a part of the project, but by this time, Rachel had completed her work and was not planning to return. However, local people working at the Equindeni Center saw the success of Rachel's program and created a working group to carry on with her work. That year, 30 women signed up and were successful in the outcome. The program kept expanding and became the Soil, Food and Healthy Communities program until 2012 when it became the MAFA program. At the time of our visit, it had resulted in over 15,000 farm families improving their lives through learning about new crops, technologies, and farming methods to produce food. Isn't that amazing? From 10 women in 2000 to over 15,000 families. Families! That could be over 100,000 people that in less than 20 years, are now self-sufficient in their food requirements. You know, it reminds me so much of the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000 with the five loaves and the two fishes, the story that we read this morning. Here we have the miracle of the feeding of 15,000 because people like you cared enough to run growing projects, to host fundraising events, and to make donations to the work of the Canadian Food Grains Bank. Through the generosity of matching government grants and the efforts of local Christian partners on the ground, your donation has multiplied time and time again to the point where it helps not just one person or one family, but hundreds and maybe even thousands of people. Following this stop, we traveled north to Karanga, where we witnessed a conservation agricultural program operated by another Canadian Food Grains Bank partner. At this site, we were shown how farmers are taught to make their own fertilizer and apply it to the soil, how to plant properly, and how to conserve soil moisture by reducing or eliminating tillage and covering the soil with old corn stalks or sesame stalks. And the results were remarkable. Danny Guira, a small-scale farmer with two acres and a family of six children, who you see here in this picture, told us his yields increased by 600%. 600%. He went from being hungry to being food secure and having some left over as well to sell and to also send his children on to further education. These are some of the amazing stories that I learned and experienced in Malawi. And those stories are a result of the work that folks like yourself do in providing the funds to Canadian Food Grains Bank. So that's a big part of what we re require from people like yourself. So what else can you do? Well, as I mentioned, giving is very important. We could not do the work we do without the generosity of hundreds or even thousands of Canadians who support the Food Grains Bank. And that 10, 20, $50 can be matched up to four to one for the best returns on a charitable dona donation that you will ever make. And just this past week, we received a farm donation of cashed out grain of over $11,000 because someone genuinely cares about the plight of others. Giving can be 
much more than just financial. Get involved. Organize an event. Pick stones. Help with a fundraiser. There are so many things that can be done. We ask people to pray. Prayer is a powerful way to support those who are hungry and those who are working in this field. Pray for people like Kalinda David that they will have enough food and find ways to become food secure. Pray for the organizations and the people working in this field who are reaching out to those who have so little. Pray that support and funding for these programs will continue and even increase. And pray for yourselves, for God to grant you a generous heart and to see the needs of others. Pray for caring and compassion for those who struggle. Learn. Just as with any issue, a greater understanding can help to motivate us to do more. Foodgrainsbank.ca is an excellent resource to learn about global hunger. We have re resources there for young and old alike. Excellent educational resources. Ultimately, you could sign up for a learning tour when those come back into place. It will change the way you think about global hunger and about poverty. And finally, we ask people to advocate. Part of our work is in advocating for those who cannot advocate for themselves. We work to ensure that policies are put in place to help those around the world who are suffering. That work becomes so much more successful when the people who represent us know that these issues are important to us as Canadians. So talk to your MP and tell them that you care about hunger and that you want Canada's support continued. This year, despite the pandemic, donations to the Canadian Food Grains Bank are ahead of last year. We are very grateful to the many donors in Canada like you who have contributed so generously to the need of others around the world and for the support of the Canadian government in their matching grant programs. As another example of this generosity, Canadians contributed over $10 million to the Beirut crisis through the Humanitarian Coalition with the government providing a further $8 million. And Canadian Food Grains Bank is part of the Humanitarian Coalition and through donations to us and our partners, we contributed over $2 million to this effort. Well done. Thank you once again for this opportunity to speak to you and for your support of Canadian Food Grains Bank. It means the world to thousands and thousands of people around the world. And you are a big part of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henry. That was a really informative talk. I learned a lot. I also realized that a small donation of $20 becomes $100, and, uh, and how very much impact uh, something like that has around the world. And it is true that our, uh, the goal of ending global hunger is a noble one, but obviously it's something that, that can be achieved when we, when we work together. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for uh, addressing us and uh, for teaching us so much today. Our last hymn is number 560, 560 in Voices United, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee.
Friends, as you have been loved, so love. As you have been welcomed, welcome. As you have been fed, feed. And as you have received, so give. And may the boundless love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and with you this day and every day. Amen. And now our postlude. 